Okay, we're ready to introduce the key concept of the whole course called the definite integral. Uh, let me give you a brief overview of what we're going to be talking about. In fact, this is an overview of the whole course here. If you don't want to know how this course ends, you might want to fast forward this, but I hope you want to know. Anyway, in a very abstract sense, it kind of parallels what you learned last quarter in Math 151 where the key concept was the derivative. Here the key concept is the definite inter integral. Now, the derivative involved a limit. It was the limit of the difference quotient, right? And the derivative exists provided this, this limit exists, okay? Well, here we're going to talk about what's called the definite integral from a to b of f of x dx, which looks a lot like the area under the curve of f of x, if you, which is what we just talked about. And the, and the answer is that it's more general than that because we, we, don't, um, we don't necessarily um, assume f is positive uh, on the whole interval from a to b. Okay, we'll talk about what it means for this limit to exist in just a minute. But it's 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 a limit of a of a Riemann sum has to exist. All right. Well, and, and the building block for the derivative last quarter was the difference quotient, right? Slope of the secant line. Well, the building block for the uh, definite integral is the Riemann sum. You can think of that loosely as the sum of the areas of the rect rectangles, but again, some of those areas may may be negative, so it's more general than that. Uh, you certainly recall from last quarter that when you first defined the derivative, it was very messy to compute. You had to go through the difference quotient and do a lot of algebra, and you finally learned those differ differentiation rules in Chapter 3 that made the whole thing a lot easier. Same thing's going to happen here. Uh, we're we're going to learn some integration rules that are, are going to make the, uh, com the computations a lot easier in just the next section, actually. Uh, Furthermore, there's lots of applications. Uh, you learned applications last quarter with derivatives, velocity, acceleration, population growth, and so on. Here, not only areas, but we're, we're talking about volume, surface areas, arc length, distance traveled, and a bunch of other things as well. So um, there's going to be lots of application problems. And the, the, the spoiler here is that next section, we're going to learn what's called the fundamental theorem of cal cal calculus. That um, There's actually two parts to it, but the second part uh, gives you a nice way of computing the definite inter integral using anti-differentiation. So that's where we're going. So let's define the definite inter integral of f of x dx on the interval a to, a to b. Um, it's, it's defined to be the limit as n goes to infinity of this Re Riemann sum. Now, the x sub i star uh, those are the x's that you pick in each subinterval. Last uh, chapter, we were generally picking the right end endpoint uh, to find the height of the rectangle, but you don't have to have to always choose the right endpoint. X, x sub i star could be the left endpoint, or it turns out x sub i star could be any value of x in the in the subinterval. The picture kind of shows it pretty well here. If you if you look at if you if you compute delta x, which is b minus a over n. In the i subinterval, you can actually pick any value of x in here to compute the height. Uh, and what, what is this dx? Th think of dx as as referring to what the what the independent variable is, or, or the x-axis here in this case. That that uh, um, that that tells you which which variable is the independent variable. Um, so when you take the limit of the Riemann sum, think of the delta x as like becoming dx. That would be okay to do. Now, this is important. Uh, this definite integral exists provided this limit exists. It has to give you the same value for all possible choices of the sample points x by star. For if, if that happens, then we say the, the function is integrable on the interval a to b. Uh, it turns out, on a lot of homework problems, we're going to continue to use as our x sub i stars the right endpoint of each um, subinterval. If, if you do happen to choose your x sub i star to be the right endpoint of each subinterval, re recall x sub i, the right endpoint of each subinterval, will be a plus i delta x. If you happen to choose the left endpoint, by the way, then x sub i would be a plus i minus 1 delta x. So, one of the reasons why we choose the right endpoint is that it's easier. It's not as messy. Okay, so here we go. Let's let's find the definite integral. Well, we're going to eventually find the definite integral of this function. f of x equals x squared minus 1 on the interval 0 to 2. First of all, we're going to find the Riemann sum for this function. Uh, 
on the interval 0 to 2 with four subintervals uh, where x sub i star is the right endpoint of each subinterval. So in other words, x sub i star, we would call that x sub i, wouldn't we? Um, anyway, we've already done this. Uh, it just so happens now that we're not calling it the sum of the areas of the rectangles because as you see by the picture, the function might, might be negative on part of the, or all the intervals, so we wouldn't call it the sum of the areas of the rectangles. You could say the net area if you want, I guess. That'd be okay. Anyway, delta x is b minus a over n. If you choose the right endpoint, x of 1 would be 1 half, x of 2 would be 1, and so on. Plug it in, form the Riemann sum. This is, this is f of 1 half times delta x. This is f of 1 times delta x, and so on. When you add those up, you get 7 fourths. So think of that as the net area under this curve. All right, let's do the same thing. Where x sub i star is now the um, left endpoint of each subinterval. If you choose the left endpoint, uh, then on the first subinterval, the left endpoint x, x sub 1 would be 0, right? x sub 2 would be 1 half, and so on. Plug those into the function. That's actually just L sub 4, isn't it? Using our notation from last chapter. Anyway, so when you, so th this would be um, f of 0 times 1 half plus f of 1 half times 1 half, and so on. When you add all, all those quantities, you get negative 1 fourth. See how different these are? If you use right endpoints versus left endpoints, your answers can vary. What if we choose midpoints now? What if we form the Riemann sum for n equal um, n equal uh, 4, where x sub i star is the midpoint of each subinterval? Um, then x, the first subinterval from 0 to 1 half, the midpoint would be 1 fourth, and so on. These are your x sub i stars here. Plug them in the function, m sub 4, this would be called, this is f of 1 fourth times 1 half, this plus f of 3 fourths times 1 half, and so on. Uh, the sum of them would give you point, 0 0.625. Does this look a lot like what we were just doing? It, it is exactly the same thing. The only thing, again, is, um, is that um, the, uh, the function doesn't have to be positive. All right, let's form the Riemann sum for i equal 1 to n now. Our answer is going to be in terms of n, where x sub i star is the, um, is the uh, right endpoint of each subinterval. Okay, so here we go. Delta x is b minus a over n, which is 2 over n. So we want to find r sub n, which is this. Uh, what is x sub i? x sub i, is always, if you use right endpoints, is always a plus i delta x. So since a is 0, this just becomes 2i over n. It's really important that you're able to do that. Plug that in for x sub i. So f of x, remember f of x is x squared minus 1. So this would be f of x sub i right here and times delta x. Now, we're going to play that game we did with the, with the summations now. Remember, this 2 over n can be brought out. That's one of the properties of summations. And then you could actually break this um, summation into two separate summations. Don't forget to distribute the 2 over n to each of them. And then on this, this one, couldn't you bring the n squared out too, and the 4? Uh, we'll do that on the next step. We could keep on going, but I'm going to do it on the next step. The, the last step is to compute the definite in integral. The definite integral is the, is the limit uh, is the limit uh, as n goes to infinity of r sub n in this case. But before we take the limit, let's um, let's keep let's keep simplifying this. I'm going to bring the four out and the n squ n squared out, so you get an n you get an n cubed out here times the sum i squares minus two over n. What's the sum i equals one to n of one? Remember that that's just n, isn't it? So this summation becomes n. Now we're going to use that formula. The sum of the i i squares. I mentioned that that comes up. The sum of the i squares i equals 1 to n is this. This becomes minus 2. The n's cancel. So if you multiply this out, you end up with this expression minus 2. So what is the answer? The definite integral uh, from 0 to 1 uh, of x squared minus 1 dx is the limit as n goes to infinity of this. Okay. Now, uh, you see what happens is the limit as n goes to infinity of negative 2 is negative 2. But the limit as n goes to infinity of this, you could use L'Hopital's rule three times. Or you could just recognize it's, it's, it's the ratio of the leading coefficients. That's okay, too. But you get, you get 16 over 6 minus 2. So your final answer is 2 thirds. There you go. If it looks like what we were doing before, the answer is it's the same idea. The only answer, the difference is the, the notation's different, and we're not insisting that um, f of x is uh, greater than 0. All right, we'll do more of this next time. Bye-bye.